I'm Rod Daniel, director of Team Wolf. I have no idea who these two guys are. <laughs> Uh, the the white on black title thing I, I just stole from uh, Woody Allen movies. Every movie he's ever made, he's done white on black with the same typeface, and and it's cheap and a way to save money and a classy way to do it. As far as the heartbeat, um, I, I think Lois Freeman, the uh, Lois Freeman Fox, the editor editoress, came up with that, um, which eventually turns into his heartbeat we did some strategic planning on this i mean we ahead but mostly it was sort of flying by the seat of the pants because we had so little prep time um we kind of made it up as we went along but i i had the idea to to replicate the end of the movie make it look like the the beginning of the slow-mo and all of that so uh, but the heartbeat was a nice touch and and it it um that was Lois's deal. Jeff Loeb and Matt Wiseman wrote the best script, the uh, most complete and structurally perfect script I've ever had the pleasure of working on. Very little to do. It was funny when I read it and, uh, and funny making it and funny in the theaters. We, all of the basketball, including this, was done at a gymnasium uh, at a place called Lenox High, which I think is still there. Uh, the odd thing about the, the location was it was at the end of the Los Angeles International Airport's busiest runway, uh, which is not where you want to go to shoot sound. And there were many, many times when we had to stop and let the jets fly over. Um, I spent m many, many hours in this place. Michael and I, Mike, I, I, I didn't say 10 words to Michael J. Fox about this character and about what we were doing because we were always making the same movie. And the other thing is I, I got to cast, it's the only movie I ever made that I got every single soul that I wanted. Um, and, and that just helps enormously, particularly if you're making a comedy. And Jay Tars is the coach. Uh, had been was famous for um, a lot of other things. He created Bob Newhart. He, he was a he was a writer. He was a writer producer who had uh, been with a partner and they had done a stand up act. So he knew comedy, and, but he wasn't an actor. I mean, he, he that's not what he did. But he was drop dead funny, and I knew he'd be right for the right for the role. We could never pay him what he was worth. And the rest of these guys were just uh, just great character actors who 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 contributed who really came in and, and uh, wonder what that girl in the back looks like now <laughs> what do they all look like It'd be scare you to death uh, boy she married a producer who could buy Illinois boof You know, comedy to, has always been to me about cynicism, and the more cynical, the the better. And there is not a more human being that's more cynical than Coach Finstock than Jay Tarsus. And we even got a great bad guy in this thing. And you know, a word about the effects here, uh, which are few and far between. You're you're. You know, we just had no money, which is not an apology, but it's and, and in some ways it probably helped the movie a little bit that the, that the effects were so cheesy and so underfunded. Uh, incidentally, whenever the there's a growl later on in the movie, that's me, and I didn't get a nickel for that. So, <laughs> so, uh, and she never Susan Ersty, who plays Boof, had never really done anything. And this is the, these are the, this, this is all locations, all Lenox High, the same gymnasium.
Michael J. Fox once said that the that the um, budget on this movie was less than the craft services budget on Back to the Future, which is the snack table. That's how little money we had. This kid was great, Mark Holman. I used him a lot. I just he just has a great face, and he was a terrific actor, and he plays a key part when we when we when Michael turns into the uh, wolf. He sort of he sort of led the audience. I, I used him as a um, a way to 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 get a message across. And Jerry Levine, who comes in his styles and his Matt somebody or other. I God, I forgot his name now. Just the quintessential hustler. Uh, I got the job of directing this movie based on the next scene, really. It was my understanding of Finstock and how, how really dark he was and how funny he was that the writers w were concerned about. They, kn they knew if I could pick out the subtlety of this character that I would understand the tone of the whole piece. And, uh, and this is, uh, of, of 30 years worth of work, one of the funniest things, probably the funniest scene I ever, because it's just, it's just this guy not wanting to meet with a student and and, <laughs> and tell him anything, and um, and Jay just put it away. It was and it, it was also a scene where I had to, uh, I had to leave the room, a couple of times because I I just couldn't stop laughing, and that's you don't want to do that in front of an actor, and and we we did this. It, this was one take. Jay's portion was one take. We added a line or two in here the, at the end, the sukasa mikas, whatever that is. That was ad lib. But uh, Jay telling this story about the woman with a pen in the hip. I mean, I, it was just, and, I, and he didn't do that. It was it was written, <laughs> but it's just, it just is about nothing. I don't know what it's about. And again, this the, uh, we're we're still at Lenox High. This, that was the gymnasium. Is the gymnasium. And and of course. <laughs> Everybody wants to know what's it's a story about a kid. He doesn't, and here's his answer. He has no idea or cares. Part of a part of being a great actor to me with a scene that's that well written is is staying in it. I mean, I just I don't know how he did it. Uh, we, 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 the high school, I forget the name of the high school, but they had a sprinkler system and I had a Titan crane and I had envisioned this shot since I started and the, and they, we, nobody had told them we were going to put a Titan crane on top of their lawn. And so we rolled in, it's a 30, it's huge. And we rolled in and they made me guarantee that I would replace the sprinkler system <laughs> personally if it, if it got damaged. So I had to sign a waiver and all this. And the, the location here is South Pasadena, which is which is looks so much it, most of it like it's old and it looks sort of like the Midwest. And a lot of movies are shot out there. Back to the Future did a lot of work out there. And and the upcoming scene, we made the biggest mistake of the movie, 
uh, which is frequently pointed out to us. Um, and I'll comment on it when we get to it. But but um, we th- there was the, the whole, there was a big controversy about what had happened to his mom because she's not in the the movie. And I'll, I'll say a word about that later. But uh, the dad's a widower, and and I had Jimmy Hampton in mind when I when I read the script. He's the first I'd done a little work with him on something else, and he's just a gentle sweet guy i think he's the father we all wish we had sort of a combination uh father mother to to michael and and he's running this hardware store and cooking and doing the laundry and all that um here's the mist- here's the classic mistake that is pointed out to us so frequently which is the scene uh with the kid and the dog whistle and the really avid fans point out why didn't the I mean everybody's seen the movie and they know what happens but why didn't the father hear the hear the whistle and why didn't he react to it also and um, when I could have gotten him out of the room with a you know I'll go in the back and do something and and we missed it we all absolutely missed it had I thought about it at the time I would have I would have shot it that way Because it's certainly no surprise to anyone that the, that the dad is um, also stricken with the same thing. So he would have reacted to it. Uh, it's worth pointing out here, too, that that we did something, you know, back in 19, whenever I did this, 85, 84, that you you couldn't even get near now, and that we didn't have. But Michael did his own stunts. I mean, you hear that a lot on movies now. Uh, but but he he did some stuff we could never that that I would never take a chance on doing. But they they we had we didn't have, we had any money, and Michael wanted to do this because he's he's um, he he was just very athletic and and was capable of doing this and wanted to do it. And I mean these are these characters are, are broad caricatures of of I think people we all know. Uh, and we're we're I've forgotten the actor's name. Scott, Mr. Lolly, the drama coach. I've... The movie was. We shot the movie in in. Um, oh boy, I think I think twenty one days. Which is really lightning fast, and with a cameraman was a guy named Tim Surstead who just did a great job in a very very quick amount of time. Um, and 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 the, and the budget on the movie was about a million two, which included thirteen original songs, which is just unheard of now. You can't run film through a camera. Well, nobody does run, uses film anymore, but it's um, it would be impossible <laughs> to. I mean, you just you couldn't touch it, and and I think is and we tried to shoot this as movies are obviously shot out of order for a number of different reasons. But we we really, with the exception of one or two scenes, we shot this in order, partly because these were younger actors and and it, it was it's just easier on everyone, um, and it and it just it helped us a lot story wise.
Tony's liquor is uh, no more. A com again, another comment about the about the mom. When, when we tested the movie, people, you, 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 when you test one of these things and they and they test everything, you get a recruited audience and you hand out cards and so forth, and people comment on the movie, and the overwhelmingly they love the movie, and, it, and then the test scores were just through the roof, but they also uh, overwhelmingly wanted to know why what happened to the mom, uh, and. And which I found interesting and a little odd, but 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 it it, it became a hang up. So we went back and, and looped a line that's in the movie later on and, and I think Jimmy says when your mom was something alive or whatever. And it just they all they all they wanted to know is what happened to her and why she wasn't. They wouldn't they weren't asking for her. They didn't miss not having the mother in there. Um and the other thing I want to say about Jimmy Hampton is, he, I, I just we had such a perfect script, and the and the best actors. I didn't have to say, I didn't say very little to any of these guys. But Jimmy Hampton wandered up to me his first day of shooting, which was the scene we're doing now, and he said, "Who is this character?" And I said, "He's a guy that knows how to make a casserole," and that's all I ever told him, because men can cook these elaborate meals, but they, they just can't cook casseroles. It takes a mom to do that. And I wanted people to understand that he, he played, and for him to understand that, that that's who he was. He had to play both roles. He said, I got it, and I never said another word to him. He just, he just knew who they were. They knew who they were. And, 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 there was, and again, a credit to the writing, they're very well defined. You don't see, you know, three of the same type. They're all a little different. And they all carry their own weight. I mean, uh, it, the the effects here are. are I mean, they, again, I, I, no apologies, but they're just cheesy. I mean, they're just really cheap when you see his eyes turn turn red. And um, I don't know. I think if you were to go back and redo it and make it perfect, it would lose part of its charm. I think that was a part of the charm. Is it, you know, everybody kind of knew what the deal was here. I mean, it's just a straight burn in. It's not even. The whole urban surfing thing was written, again, the script was written by Logan Wiseman, and, and they went to Columbia University Graduate School, and, and they actually got loaded up and went, took a, took a van down to Park Avenue and did this. Uh, there, there was such a thing as urban surfing, and they, they wrote in their experiences. Um, we this is on a road called Sherman Way. It's in it's in Los Angeles. It's in the Valley for those who live out there, and it was an all nighter. It, it was a it was just tough because we had to light all the portions of this street. We used a lot of light of it, and we had to find some place that was very deserted.
and Jerry ad lib this last line, this, the last word of this scene. And we left it in. It wasn't in the script. I just think it's great. He turns to Michael and says, Kids, I think. At one point, we had Jerry on the roof because because I you can you can't double forever. You got to inject the actor in at some point in time. So he strapped his feet down and 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 went as slow as I could go so that he wouldn't. God forbid something happened, it wouldn't kill him. But the close-ups are we're not moving the obviously, and and the rest of the stuff is with a stuntman. And the same thing obviously is true with with Michael. And, and and again the 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 effects. I mean, you 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 he he has these ears and then he doesn't, or he doesn't and then he does. You just couldn't get away with that today. It's too bad. Yeah, and when they pull up to the. Uh, Michael runs into this. This wasn't supposed to happen. He smashes into the back of the. I think he bumps the back of the. Yeah, it was a, and that wasn't supposed to happen. And it got a laugh between the two actors right here, which was the bump, not the script. This whole scene, I had researched. I, I had wanted to find out. It, 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 it's theoretically we're t it's, we're in Nebraska, in a little small town in Beacon Town, Nebraska. And I don't, I was 34 years old. What did I know what kids did in Nebraska? So I took a trip to Nebraska and got a bunch of kids in, in a room and just asked them about everything, about drugs, about sex, rock and roll, what they did. Did they love the town? Would they move? Everything I could think of. And it was a three-hour session with about 21 kids from, from – uh, uh, Fremont, Nebraska High School, and they they one of the things they told me. I said, "What do you do for parties?" And they said, "We uh, we wait until one of us one of our parents goes out of town, then we move all the furniture out on the lawn, lawn, and we party down and move everything back." So I did that. I used that in the movie, and uh, um, and and also the the stuff that we're about to see the the game that that they get involved in all that came from the students the jello the whole thing This is a long way to go for a joke, and I, I never was quite sure <laughs> if this paid off or not. But 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 this did. Um, there, the kids in Fremont had a more X-rated version of this than we can put on the screen, <laughs> much more. But uh, and 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 a much more X-rated version with with the uh, with the with the jello and we didn't know what to do with the we, we really improvised this this was a lot of improvisation and we kind of rehearsed this a little bit and we didn't know what to do and it wasn't working and and michael finally said look there's got to be something we can do we got a bowl of jello a fat guy and a girl with big tits somewhere in there's a comedic moment <laughs> and uh, and jerry just did it you know he just he just did it and and I told Timmy I said just just put a, a coupe which is a big overall bright light up on top don't 
put any fill light so we don't run into anything. Let's just shoot it. And we did. And, and, they, and they just, everybody in the room, they're involved in the scene. And the reason they're involved in the scene is because it's well written and well acted. I didn't know he was what he was. I, I said, what are you going to do with the jello? He said, I don't know. I'll find something to do. And he, that's what he did. There's Mal this kid Malcolm. Boy, he could play piano. So when we were setting up and lighting, he would sit down and play uh, a lot of Elton John stuff. He was terrific. And I think this is Jerry's finest moment. And and <laughs> Michael never was terribly fond of his leading lady. I, I mean, they, I, it just, he, I don't know what he, why or anything. It wasn't a problem. But, but, when he, but in this scene, when he kisses her, there, there, is a, there was a um, great running back for the Chicago Bears named Walter Payton. And, uh, and somebody asked him, I guess I did afterward, because he, plants one on her. I said, how was it kissing? And he said it was like kissing Walter Payton. I don't know what that means, but that's what he said. So it wasn't, wasn't a great. We, we, the the slap we had to do, just any thing we had to do it three or four times because the first time she just whacked him, and nearly knocked him out. And Michael said, "Can you talk to her and explain to her what a stage slap is?" And I said, "Yeah," and did. <laughs> so. The, ho the location, the house is in South Pasadena, and it was, oddly enough, the same house that Back to the Future used. It was just strange. In fact, when we were shooting, they were out scouting this house. Um, this is obviously the, the sort of the, one of the pivotal scenes in the movie. And... Um, And I said we shot the movie in 21 days. We did, with the exception of this scene. We we came back. We shot everything but this interior bathroom scene when he actually changes. And it's it, this is a, a, a an amazing set of uh, it's an amazing editing job by Lois Freeman because we didn't. We, there, there's only one shot where you see the hair actually growing. 
Uh, but again, because we just didn't have any money. So we had to change. And Lois, I shot probably a hundred and some odd setups in there of this thing. So she'd have something to cut to. Because because you, you when you cut to these, the fingers and the hair and all that, it's already happened. It happens off camera. But nobody seems to care. I mean, it, 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 it worked and it got past an audience and we believe it. And, uh, he, had, he Michael has a line in here where the dad's knocking on the door and he says, I can't come out. I'm changing. And, um, finally, when he opens the door, uh, I had done directed comedy for 10, 11, 12 years in Los Angeles of, hundred or so sitcoms it's the biggest and this is the biggest laugh I ever got in any thing I ever did comedy was all I did and it was we didn't we knew it was funny but it obliterated the next minute of the film uh, the audience just went insane when he opens the door I mean it was absolutely huge it was probably the it's probably the moment in the film if you had to point one out this is all just a little bitty set right in the middle of a stage three at Raleigh Studios. If you go outside that door, there's a piece of wood holding up the wall. Uh, and when he opens the door, we shot that portion over of Jimmy. We shot the next. We shot this in in the house, and that was in Raleigh. So we had a cutting job ahead of us. And no, and the audience is they're going crazy laughing, and they never heard any of this. Or very little of this. I think um, I think too that um, that part of the longevity in the movie is, and part of the the quote message. I hate that, but and 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 we didn't. It, there was no it, deliberate, you know, preaching to anyone. But it's a moment where the kid says, I, I, you know, it's the beginning of a, of, a, of a series of scenes where he, he just he can't believe that his father, first of all, didn't tell him about this. But more importantly, his father can't do anything about it. And, and that's, a, that's a terrible realization to come to, that your father can't fix everything. And, so, and what he says, of course, is you have to learn to live with it. And that's, that's one of the things we do in the movie. I, we did some looping in here that is so embarrassing. I mean, it's just we we had one shot at this. <laughs> it's just, it's just we might have, we put a should have put a sign that says loop line here and a super or something <laughs> because it's just oh yeah yeah is it awful? But you do what you can. And I think this is the mom line was in here somewhere. I love the fact that Hampton is his dad's kind of trying to sell him on the idea of being a wolf, um, and he's right. He's right. It's a it's a mixed bag. Some of it's good, like everything else in life. When I went to interview for this for this job, they had talked to I don't know fifteen other directors, and they said uh, the the writers who were also producers, had asked one question, what's the movie about? And and apparently all the rest of them had said, it's about a werewolf who blah, 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 blah. And I was the only one that walked in and said, this is a movie about a father and son who happens to be a werewolf. And and again, I think that contributes to the longevity because, because a movie called Fast Time at Ridgemont High had just come out and there was a character played by Sean Penn named Spicoli who was a quintessential surfer dude and wore funny clothes and hats and all that. And the studio wanted that. And I fought them every inch of the way and won because what I wanted was this huge event happening to this normal kid who lived a normal life, and um, uh, which, is, which is what Hitchcock did in, in most of his films. He just took a, 
uh, Everyday Joe and subjected him to enormous pressure, and, and we, the audience, got the benefit of, of, of watching him go through this, uh, this agony, and, and this is what happens to Michael. So we resisted any attempt to... Uh, I mean, I never in soft... You know, hats don't make people laugh, and 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 the studio tried and tried and tried, and they never quite understood the movie that I was making. I'm I'm not sure I understood the movie I was making, but 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 we stayed the course. I mentioned that I got the cast and just even these little roles um, the teachers and the, they're, they're so important people that have one or two lines and I just got everybody I wanted I never know how we got Jerry's shirt past the ratings board. I really, I just, what are you looking at, Dick, Dickhead or Dick Nose or whatever it is? I don't understand, but we did, and I mean, it would have, it would have put us into a, a an R, I think. And and late and earlier when he came, he, he Michael asked him when he first comes to pick him up. If, if there's anything going around and he said no but Mr. So-and-so's got his dick caught in something a memo I don't know how we got away with that either and and when I mentioned I mean this is Michael doing this all of this he just had great control of his body and it was it was it's so gratifying not to have to make a cut as a director to put in a stunt guy that's my that's him I think part of of uh, of buying the wolf was just uh, there's a there's a 
famous producer in, in Los Angeles years ago uh, named George Slaughter, who had a sign above his desk. He was a comedy producer. It says, when you're skating on thin ice, skate fast. Boy, we were on thin ice. And so we don't linger. I mean, once he turns around, you know, again, it's a, it's a, he did all of this off camera. And you, and you just can't get away with this now. You, this two, all, movies are all effects. You can't do it. Audience will walk out of the theater. But we did. And, and one of the reasons we got by it is just by pressing ahead. Because Jerry, you know, rather than running screaming or calling the cops or whatever, sees commerce in this immediately. And, and so that's what it becomes about. And that's, I think, part of the reason we were able to get away with it. Very good writing in that sense. We just, we just, we were thin, skating on very thin ice. Uh, and the thinnest ice is in the, in the upcoming basketball scene. Yeah, he's bought in now. He's he he's just all he's thinking about is making money. I hated the title initially, Team Wolf. Hated it. And uh, so the studio said, all right, make up a list of other names. I did. And they took them out and they tested them and tested them and none tested as high as Team Wolf. I said, because, because you know what the movie's about. And um, again, remembering way back, I, the next scene I had, um, I had about 10 or 15 minutes to shoot it. Otherwise, we ran out of light. It was right across the street from the location in South Pasadena. And one way to do that is to just shoot it as what we call a one-er. Uh, no coverage, no, except at the end, there's, some, I think, a couple of close-ups. One take, 300 millimeter lens, and... Uh, we were pretty much out of line. Yeah, we did. It was this was just one single take. I'd forgotten whether we inserted some close-ups in here or not, but we didn't because we didn't have time. <clears throat> the sun went down. We didn't have any lights, so.
This is the most critical part in in the movie, and this this scene it, we 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 really fretted over uh, for weeks uh, because if this didn't work, the the movie wouldn't have worked at all. This this scene because this is where he changes into the wolf on the basketball court, and and again uh, going back to George Slaughter's skate fast, holy mackerel! We were moving a hundred miles an hour here. We had to get the audience. I had to take the audience down a road that um, that we weren't sure they were going to be able to make. And and we're we're tipping them off. We're we're telling them uh, with the eyes and and all of this that it's coming because we've already had the explanation uh, when Jerry, in the garage when Jerry asked about can you do this anytime you want he says yeah well, I guess so so we 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 we're kind of warning them we're we're telling them here it comes. And and here it is. I mean, the, the, it, and when he comes out of this pile, the movie can go. If if we're doing a real, if we, you know. If you're if you're dealing at any level with reality, these people would run screaming from this this uh, gymnasium and call the cops and who knows what else. And I, we had to get them off that. We had to get them off of of thinking about that, of this human being turning into a wolf. I mean, what's can he kill people? What's the deal? And put it smack on basketball because they they haven't won a game in however many years, and this is what they care about. They want to win basketball games because they'll get, you know, be heroes, and they'll get girls, and that's what they want. So quickly, and I and I took this kid, the fat kid, and sort of told this next couple of minutes through his eyes, and he goes through periods, through stages of sort of horror, and then wonder, and then, you know, this could be okay. This is all I had to see. This is what I had to do. Yeah. Now the kid is going, oh man, look at this. And and the wheels are starting to turn for everybody. And and there's a sense of wonder and a slight smile appears on the kid's face, on the fat kid's on Chubby's face. Yeah, that. That says I don't care if this if he what he turned into. If he turned into a mountain lion or a shark, he can play basketball. And and now we're on to what we want to make the movie about. And he, and we uh, we didn't know what, how the audience would react to it, and they and they they were right with us when we tested the movie. It just it just worked. This is what's important to them. They don't they don't care who it is. And it it really energized the whole group. I want I'm gonna say something about the extras too later on in, in who we who took we took six days to shoot all the basketball scenes. And then this stunt double for Michaels doesn't look anything like him. He didn't built like him, doesn't look but the kid could, you know, he was taller. I mean it was just it was just, you know, it was what it was. And of course we had a trampoline out there and and um
And I, I think the other thing, too, is apropos of what he talked to his father about is he's bought into it. So so he's this this is good. This whole wolf thing. This is going to work out. Your girls and I'm a great athlete and. We never were visited on the set, uh, or never, uh, except one time, and it was this day. And there was a, a woman who was the executive in charge from the studio, and I forgot what her name is. Actually, I, I haven't forgotten what her name is, but I'm going to give her name. <laughs> she, and it's back to the Spicoli. Let's put him in funny jackets and clothes and all this bullshit. And she came out with all these wardrobe. And, and I was in my motorhome preparing for the some scene, and I heard she was there, and I, I, I went into the set and, and was fully prepared to throw her, say, get out, don't come back. And Michael had already done it, God bless him, the star of the movie. It said, you know what, we, I, 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 tr I believe in the movie we're making, and goodbye. That's the last we ever saw her. Which, which made the movie that much more fun to, to direct because I, I really did sort of get everything I wanted to get um, in this little picture. Oh boy, these people are, they're indefatigable, these extras. We, we, I don't know, the, Six days I shot basketball games, and um, and we had the same group of extras show up every every day. And when I have extras, um, a big group like that, I make a little speech and tell them about the camera and not to look in the camera. I never had to do that with these groups because they got involved in the basketball games. I mean, they 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 I didn't have to tell them to do anything. And it was just wonderful. I mean, they were getting like ten bucks a day or something, or fifteen bucks a day, and they showed up. I mean, every we didn't lose one of them over the six days, and they got very, very involved in the, in the story, and um, and 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 really contributed. They really helped us out. And so now the um, the the it isn't so great for all of his friends because what is what is what he talked about with his father is starting to become uncovered.
she dreaded this scene uh, because she oh boy getting through this was a nightmare and we did the, the things that you do when an actress has to take her clothes off we cleared everybody else out of there we could possibly clear out and we had no monitor and we had no script supervisor and blah 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 but it, it was uh, like pulling teeth The writers are in this scene. If you look, uh, uh, there are two guys off to his left. You'll see them in a second, with both with beards. One little guy and one great big guy with bowling right there, right in the back. That's Matt Weisman with a striped shirt on, and and sitting down is uh, Jeff Loeb. They wanted a little cameo appearance, so we put him in the movie. And then they started hogging the movie, so I kicked them the hell out. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. And we sort of make another turn here uh, when, when at the end of this little scene, which was which was a little tiny scene we, we added, I think. I don't think this was in the original. We wanted to, we wanted him to understand the reality of, of fame, that it's fleeting. And that, that uh, for the first time, you know, since he changed at the gym that that he can see and have evidence of the fact that it's not not people talking to behind his back but to him she's not going to leave her boyfriend she never was she just wanted to be seen she wanted to rub shoulders with the rich and famous and that we 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 uh, I think we had looked at a port and now you can see that, that things are sort of headed south but they're getting sick of them. If if you watch the blockage of um, he he Michael goes down in into the shower and comes back not the wolf because we didn't 
We, we didn't have any money. It's the only way we knew how to do it. We tried for a, a, a B story uh, or to add a, 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 the, 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 his, the, Levine's, Styles' buddy, the little guy, is, is really physically afraid of him. And, it, and we didn't do it. It didn't work out. It, it culminates with a, with, in the – and we made another huge mistake here, which is that you see palm trees all over the place. And there aren't any in Nebraska. And this was in South Pasadena. And it was just, we just, I, whether, I don't know whether we knew it and let it go. Probably. Uh, hoping no one would see, but, uh, but they did. We we know we also the writers also knew we needed a scene sort of at the end where they where they you know they 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 both have this affliction and they you know the only two people in the world I guess that do and um, and it's kind of a bonding thing it's sort of a, a, a again hats off to the writers we needed a sort of a a scene where they get back together again and talk more as friends than as father and son. And so he tells him this story about uh, the principal. There's a there is a scene in the in the television version 
that has to do with the dog and and humping his leg and and the, the, like there's this sort of sexual attraction and and another scene at night when Michael's walking home late and he's followed by a pack of dogs again the same thing we shot it and I and I cut it out of the picture because I just it, I couldn't quite make it work it, it didn't hurt and it was put back in the television and the and the airline and all that use uh, uh, run because they needed they needed extra time. Michael J. Fox should never, ever be allowed to dance. It should be, should be a law that he, the guy, all the stunts he did, it was just painful. So he's bought in. He's gone, and and we we we, we I mentioned earlier the 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 business with the with the uh, Styles's friend and the fact that he was physically afraid of him. This is the the payoff to that scene, and I think the audience was confused. I, I think they they never quite understood because we didn't spend enough time and we didn't really develop it properly. We we thought we had. And, and in the end, I don't think we needed it, but um, you can see when the violence starts, you can we, we, we cut to his face and he's supposed to be telling the story and it just it just didn't work. 
and you wonder about things like this and you and you wonder if you had the footage or or um and i don't remember i don't i just i don't remember whether we thought we had it and didn't um And, and, and we had a we had we had we had laughter, and and they were supposed to be laughing at him. And and again, it was great confusion in terms of what the laugh was for. But the idea was here. We, I think we got the idea across. But there it is. This is the shot of of the kid that we that is just terrified. And this is why he has backed away from him. And, and but it just the audience didn't pick up on that. In any event, he's made a horrible mistake, and he now realizes that, that violence could be a... Um, that's the part he may not be able to control.
the only um, the only major disagreement I had with the, with the uh, writers occurs here. Uh, it, actually, in the next scene when it, when the when we start the basketball game, they had written that he came in as as the wolf and then and then decides to change back into Scott Howard somewhere during the game. And I felt very strongly that he had to have made that decision already. There was also a scene that we had shot after uh, the um, the dance where he goes to his dad and they sit on the stoop and they talk about what's happened. And that's and we and I cut it out. It's one of the first things I cut out because it was like we were telling what we had already seen. And at this point, he's made the decision. He it's already made. He knows the dangers of doing this. He knows that he can't. He's had his 15 minutes of fame and that this power that he's got is big and real and frightening to a lot of people. And so this is the nobility, as it were, of the character. This is when he decides to do the right thing. And um, and his friends, even his friends, even Styles, just can't believe this. So when he enters the game here, um, the writers just said, we disagree with you, and, and we, we don't know how to write that. And it was, I said, well, okay, so I, I wrote it. I mean, it wasn't that big a change. I mean, they're getting slaughtered. And uh, and it's worth noting here, because I'm at the end, this is a great story about these extras. When we shot this basketball game in particular, they just went crazy. These people were nuts. They were just they were just screaming and yelling for Beacon Town. They 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 weren't making a movie. They were watching a basketball game. Uh, also, there's a dolly shot in here where you can see the uh, second camera. We go right past a guy hunched over a camera with a vest on. Nobody saw it. Who cares? This is a this is the moment in the film for me. Because they want the wolf. They want to use him. They don't care about him. They just want what he can do. And, and of course, Jerry's seeing all of his investment go down the drain. This in the in the uh, somewhere in the when 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 you shoot uh, photograph plays in in any sport it, you have to set it up and you have to rehearse it everything in here was where every move is, has to be rehearsed because you have to know where to put the camera and it's and it just takes a long time I mean each one of these shots just takes forever and and. Michael came to me and and they we had been shooting basketball for probably a day and Michael came up to me and said, "Look, let us just play ball. Let us give us the basketball and let us just run and shoot and photograph it, because you know we're just getting tired of all these setups." And I said, "Okay, fine." So we put a thousand feet on the uh, on the camera and Michael went out and they played basketball and all I can tell. The public is somewhere in a vault. 
is about an hour of the most embarrassing sports footage ever taken. They played and did not make one goal. <laughs> so Michael finally came to me and said, we'll do it your way, and that was the end of that. Um, and Now, here is where the extras are. are uh, we're, we're headed toward the end of this film, and, it, and no surprise, they're going to pull it off. Because what he's engendered is, of course, respect and belief in themselves. Uh, because he believes in himself now, so uh, it's it's just uh, it's just a classical ending. You know, the audience is obviously way ahead of us on this. They know what's going to happen, and that's great. The fun is watching it happen. Uh, you don't have to guess what's going to happen. Now, toward the very end of the film, talk, speaking of the extras again, <laughs> we, at, well, at the, at, the, at the very end, they, um, how way do we get there? I don't even think the ball hit the wall on that shot. <laughs> this, kid, this kid was an awful player. As we're coming up toward the end of the movie, the, <laughs> the extras just got so involved and, and we're, we're, and they, they 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 eventually get into a little shoving match, and what hap and and I've never seen this happen in anything I ever did. The the audience, the extras, the paid extras, got so upset that they were shoving these our home team around. They started coming out of the stands, and we were afraid they were going to break out into a fight. And all of a sudden, we call the teamsters in to <laughs> get them back in their seats. There's the brief shot of Jerry. There's the camera right in front of the lens. And there it is again. <laughs> Right here, when this happened, when, when and he really smacked him. Michael went down and he was hurting, and and they almost got into it. I mean, the fight, the there, there was almost a fight, because I told him I wanted it very real. I wanted it short of fisticuffs, and and part of the extras, you don't see this because we cut it out of the film, but they started coming down onto the floor to help, because I wanted everybody really worked up. And it got a little rough 
and I want I wanted that. I wanted to And this is to go back to the beginning of the film, the slow motion portion. This is when I, the, the the one of the only two or three ideas that I had time to sort of tie the film up and and uh, stylistically give it a little pizzazz. That's he. We shot nineteen of those things, I think, before it ever went in. Because I wanted that in a one -er. I had to show the audience that that he actually made the shot. In this instance, and then here is the tie into the beginning of the film. The thing that the shot, obviously, that's that's become famous in this close at the very end of the credits is this kid who uh, pulls his pants down and moons the camera. And the amazing thing about that is Lois and I cut this film for six months and never saw that. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, we until somebody wrote in and said why, the, and I said no, there's no kid mooning the camera, and there is. It's right at the very end. I've said many times about this this picture that I, I, I knew how to do everything. I knew where to put the camera. I knew what to say to the actors, and it was my first film. And, and I think the most fun, you know, your, your, your first love. Nobody bothered us. Nobody came. They all thought if this thing made a buck at the box office, they'd be happy. But... Um, it was, and and I certainly didn't think I was making any sort of cult hit here, um, but I'm a, a a big believer in in the the big ending, and um, and with with the script, somebody said, "What does the director do?" And 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 my answer always was, "Ideally, nothing." Because if you have a perfect script, which I did, and the cast, which was I think perfect and a crew which was just stellar, uh, and everybody understands what you're doing, it, 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 it becomes less of a job. We 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 um we recorded we we mixed this 
the the sound and the picture at at Warner Brothers uh, Hollywood. But we we recorded all the music in a little teeny studio in Santa Monica uh, that was near the composer's house because his wife was pregnant and was about to deliver a child and and did in the course of making the movie and um, I decided to give her a credit at the at the very end. Welcome, McKenna Goodman. 